chapter 6, and to read verses 16 through 19. We've been doing a, a study on the things that God hates, and there are specifically several that are laid out in Proverbs 16. When I first started this, my intention was just to hit it within a couple of days, and to then schedule and staff meetings and various things have uh, interfered, and so today we'll try to pick up and finish up at least uh, one or two more. And the Bible says in Proverbs chapter number 6, beginning in verse number 16, uh, These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him, a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift and running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. Well, out of all the things that God hates that are recorded in the Bible, uh, these are seven of the lists that are mentioned that it's more than just things that God hates are an abomination unto the Lord. And we've been looking at those very briefly. And this morning, I want to look at the uh, fourth thing very briefly, if I may, this morning, at least launch out into the subject matter. Uh, we find, first off, that God hates a proud look. And when you consider the matter, our generation is heated up with pride from the pew to the pulpit. And as we consider the various um, pride that is in politics and individual lives today, and God says that he hates it. And so as we consider the matter, God hates an attitude of self-sufficiency. And yet the Bible says that God gives grace to the humble. Then also we look at the, verse, or the second thing, and number two, God hates a lying tongue. Uh, God hates the lies that people tell. We've seen that uh, God hates a lying tongue. Uh, God made the tongue. He made it to give glory and honor to himself as we have examined in the scripture. Uh, however, we find that Satan, as is often recorded in the scripture, he'll take things that God uses for his honor and glory. He'll twist it and use it against God. And he'll use humanity as a tool, the vessel, or the catalyst in which to do so. As we consider the matter, we find that there are several times in the scriptures where uh, Satan duplicated the miracles that Moses uh, gave when he was leading the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. And up until a certain point, we find that the Bible says that Satan is a liar. Uh, he is a liar and the father of the liar, uh, liars. And then the Bible tells us that God used language to confound the language of the people at the Tower of Babel. And through that, he dispersed the people on the planet Earth. And Satan has been using it to try to destroy and to uh, divide and to conquer God's people ever since then. We find that uh, yesterday that uh, the tongue is set on fire of hell and it's an unruly member of the body and the Bible says who can tame it. As we consider the matter yesterday, we also look very briefly at uh, the third thing where the Bible says that God hates uh, hands that shed innocent blood. And that may seem to be a... Um, of kind of a frivolous uh, statement or something that we would take oversight to in the beginning uh, of the reading of this text. And yet we find that there are several examples in the Bible of hands that shed innocent blood. We looked at Jezebel and Ahab and uh, how the Jezebel uh, had Naboth killed because of Ahab wanting his vineyard and uh, the lies that were told against him and the uh, framing of his uh, life and his testimony. And so we find that Jezebel and Ahab have blood on their hands when they stand before the Lord. We didn't go into it, but the book of Ezekiel very clearly talks about uh, people having bloody hands before their Lord because they have not warned the people of their sin and their transgression and the pending danger and evil that is before him. David, when he stands before the Lord, will have blood on his hand for the killing and the slaying of Uriah the Hittite, Bathsheba's husband. And so we find that in the Bible, there are several records of God's people and also sinners that have bloody hands. And uh, then we find that, and I say this uh, this morning, as I said yesterday in the closing of the thought, I believe that Hillary Clinton will stand before God and that she'll have blood on her hands for our ambassador, uh, Chris Stevens, and what took place in Benghazi in 2013. Bloody hands. The Bible says God said, I hate those hands that shed innocent blood. And then this morning, I'd like to get into the fourth thing that's found in our text, if I may. <clears throat> Notice, if you would, please, in the scripture where the Bible says, he hates a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. And so we find in the very beginning and opening of the scripture in the book of Genesis. In fact, if you want to turn back there with me very quickly, I'll go to that passage of scripture in Genesis chapter 6 and make brief application or examination of this text. Notice if you would please with me in Genesis chapter number 6. And God's getting ready to destroy man. And the Bible says in verse number 1, And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, 
and daughters were born unto them. And then in verse number two, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they had. And the Lord said, My spirit shall always strive with man, for that he is also flesh, and yet his day shall be in 120 years. Now notice you would please down in verse number five. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every, watch this, imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him in his heart. And the Lord said, I'll destroy man whom I've created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for repenteth me that I've made them. And so notice in verse number five, the reason why God determined to destroy man from the face of the earth was not so much their actions and their deeds, but the Bible says that God saw the wickedness of the heart. And the Bible said it was great in their imagination. Every imagination, every thought of the heart was vile and wicked and corrupt before God. And so God determined that he would destroy man. May I just say to you this morning that God hates a heart that is wicked and vile toward him and a heart that deviseth evil things, mischief things, that imagines uh, the most vile and corrupt things that you can imagine. God hates a heart that is gone to that extent in the heart. I've often said this, and, and that is, and I made the statement in one of our advanced uh, missionary training classes, our leadership classes a few years back. I believe that one of the most corrupt, vile places that is on the planet Earth is in the heart of a backslidden preacher because he is, has a heart that is against God, that has turned its back against God. And God said, I'm going to destroy man whom I've created because his imagination, his thoughts, and his heart is evil and wicked before God. One of the greatest battlefields on the planet Earth today is not found in the Ukraine with the invasion of Russia, as horrific as that is and as terrible as it is, and even one of our own missionaries' life is at stake in that country. I can't leave because of the uh, martial law that's been signed into effect, and I understand all those circumstances, but that's not the most corrupt and vile battle that's taken place on the earth. The most violent battle taking place on the planet earth is in the heart of mankind. That's where the greatest battles take place on the planet earth. The Bible has three uh, different um, references to the heart. We'll look at those very briefly momentarily. Uh, first, I want to give you just some references to the heart. Uh, there's three types of uh, references dealing with the heart uh, in the dictionary. And so the first one starts out with a medical term that it's a hollow muscle, a uh, muscular organ that pumps the blood through the circulatory system with rhythmic contractions and dilations. And so that's the physical aspect of the heart. That's the medical aspect of the heart. Without the heart, man cannot live. That's why uh, heart attacks uh, take people's lives when they don't have immediate medical attention, and then there's others when their heart just totally gives out, and regardless of their medical attention that they receive in a very um, timely manner, uh, they're still deceased, they pass out and go out into eternity to stand before God. That's the medical or the scientific aspect of the heart. It's the physical heart that God gave. We cannot live without the physical heart. God designed it to pump blood uh, through the body. It is a life-giving source. And then there's, uh, it's used in the scripture as poetic or artistic, and it's a center of the total personality, especially when reference to the intuition, the feelings, or the emotions. And so it is used in that fashion. And then there's the uh, spiritual aspect of it. It's the innermost seat of our emotion, our mind, our will, our conscious of the heart of man. And often when God speaks of the heart and the mind, they're interchangeable in the scripture and in the word of God. And so we must understand that the heart is very important to mankind, not only physically, but also spiritually. And we must understand that God considers the heart and God hates a heart that devises wicked imaginations and that individual that uses the heart to turn against God, against his people, against his church, against his word. God hates the heart of the individual who uses his heart as a vile, corrupt thing. And there are many in our generation that do it and they use it in that fashion to destroy ministries, to destroy individuals, to destroy uh, in an attempt to destroy the Bible or the church. But I've got news for you. 
Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of God. And I'm grateful that God is on the throne and God considers the matter. Now, the heart of God, and somebody may say, uh, well, Brother Ellis, can't you speak in on anything positive? Well, the texts I'm reading and preaching on or teaching on really don't have a lot of positive in it. It didn't say these things doth the Lord hate it said, or the Lord love. It says these six things are a seven are an abomination unto the Lord. I was reminded of, as I said the other day, of a friend uh, from years gone by that was in school. And uh, every time he'd stand to preach in the college chapel, he'd preach on sin and he'd nail it to the wall and skin it. And uh, they came to him and said, Bill, and said, don't you know that there's subject matters in the Bible besides things that God hates? Don't you understand there's the love of God in the Bible? And uh, the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. There's much more in the Bible than just the things that God hates. You ought to consider preaching on something uh, that uh, on the subject matter of love. And so the next time it came his time to stand and preach in chapel, he took his text from the book of 1 John. He preached on love. Love not the world, neither things are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And the truth of the matter is, uh, when we consider the Bible, it has several things to say about the heart. One, it speaks of the heart of God. In, in our text verse, or a verse that we've read a moment ago, in Genesis 6 and verse number 6, and it repented the Lord that he had made man on earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And so the Bible refers to the heart of God. God has a heart. And his heart is for sinners, and his heart is to see the world saved. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Thank God for the heart of God. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus our Lord. And I'm concerned that in the day and age we live, that for the majority of the Christians that are upon the planet Earth, our heart is not a heart or a mind that is after the mind of the heart of God. Sin starts in the heart. It starts in the mind, the will, the emotions. Before there's ever an action, there was a contemplation of the heart. The Bible very clearly uh, bears this out in the scripture. A man who uh, acts vile and corrupt, uh, he, it started in his heart. He considered the matter. He allowed his heart and his mind to linger upon it. There are many in our churches today with a corrupt heart. You say, well, why aren't you preaching to sinners? Because I'm at the Rock of Ages devotion, and I don't know that we have any sinners in here today that are unsaved. And so I would speak to those of us that profess the name of Christ. And most of the rebuke in the Bible uh, was to the people of God. Uh, from the Old Testament, the household of Israel, to the New Testament church. In Ezekiel 28, and verse number 2, he said, Son of man, say unto the prince of uh, Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God, I sit on the seat of God, and in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man, and not God, thou, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. And so we find that men are constantly trying to imitate and set themselves up as God. I'm reminded of what the preacher said some years ago. He said, the whole world better thank God that I'm not God because I'd probably be the only one in existence. <laughs> the truth of the matter is, uh, the heart is deceitful. And that leads us to our second thought. The Bible makes references in three places to the heart of God. But in Jeremiah 17, 9, it speaks of the heart of man. You say, well, if God has a heart that's good toward man and it's God's will that all men be saved and come to know Christ as their Savior, and shouldn't man have the same heart? Isn't man's heart naturally prone to goodness? You know, that's what the liberals and secular society would have us believe, that the heart's, you know, inside every man is goodness and inside of every man is good deeds and good works. And uh, that's just naturally that man's born with this naturally in the heart. Not the case. You say, how do you know that? Because the Bible bears it out in Jeremiah 17, verse number nine. He said, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. Somebody says, well, just follow your heart. You better be careful following Amen. your heart. Yes, sir. You better be careful of following your heart. Why? Because the heart is deceitful. It's wicked and the heart will destroy you and the heart will lead you astray from the things of God. The heart is deceitful. Yeah. It must be a heart that seeks after God. 
the Bible says in the scriptures and of all places, bears fact in the New Testament that David had a heart that sought after God. He was a man after God's own heart. We must seek God because our heart, humanly speaking, our mind, our will, our emotions is deceitful and vile and wicked. And notice what he says, I, the Lord, search the heart. If we think we have such a good heart, wait till God gets done with his audit. And his examination. He said, I the Lord search the heart. I try the reins. Even to give every man according to his ways. And according to the fruit of his doings. I'm persuaded this morning that much of what's taken place in our ministries and our churches. You say, preacher, you sound like you're awful down on uh, churches and ministries and preachers and Christians. I'm really not. But in the day and age we live, there's a lot of vile, wicked things that take place underneath, quote, the name of Christ, right. quote, unquote. Yeah, right. It's the Lord led me to do this and God has nothing to do with it. He's That's not right. within a million miles of what people profess that Christ led them to do. The Lord doesn't lead toward a sin and transgression and things that are against the Bible. And yet men all the time say, well, I feel like the Lord led me to do it. When there's direct scripture in contrary, in conflict with what supposedly the Lord led them to do. Right. So the heart is deceitful. You say, how do you know that? What's an example in the Bible? Well, what about a Naaman or a Haman with Mordecai? What about Haman? He, in his heart, uh, the Bible very clearly uh, speaks of it in the book of Esther. Let me get this and I'll need to close. Her time's already gone. I haven't even uh, gotten started this morning. And in Esther chapter two, or chapter three, verse number two, and all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman. For the king had so commanded concerning him, but Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence. Then the king's servants, which were in the king's gate, said unto Mordecai, Why transgressest thou the king's commandment? Now it came to pass that when they spake daily unto him, and he hearkened not unto them, that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's matters would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. And when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath, and he thought scorn. Notice the word thought in that scripture. In other words, in his heart, he was offended. He was highly um, dis in his heart, he was highly dissed and disdained Mordecai because he himself had not been paid reverence. And the Bible said that he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone. And so here's hands that shed innocent blood, and here's a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations and wicked thoughts against the man of God. And Mordecai had the character and integrity to say, I'll obey God rather than man, whatever the price may be, along with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. And so we find that here it says he thought to lay hands on Mordecai alone, uh, for they had showed uh, him the people of Mordecai, wherefore Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom. And uh, then he goes on to speak about even specifically Mordecai. We're talking about a heart that deviseth wicked things and imaginations. These things the Bible says God hates. I want to just forewarn us this morning, if I may, and I need to close. But maybe we be careful with our heart. Because where your heart goes is where your actions are going to go. The man that speaketh lies and deviseth the lies. It starts in the heart. When the heart gets in a condemning matter, in a caustic matter, and we can speak no good, no kindness, and we begin to speak those things against God's people, the Bible says, God says, I hate a heart that deviseth wicked things and imagination. It starts in the heart, and that heart affects the outcome of our actions and our deeds. The truth of the matter is we're all made different. We all have different temperaments. We all have different talents. We all have different gifts. We all have different opinions. God knows we have different opinions among fundamental Baptists and all of God's people. It's not a matter, as I've said so often over the years, it's not a matter of whether or not we have disagreements or whether or not we're going to go through deep valleys of darkness and, and our own trials and troubles in our heart, but it's a matter of how we come out on the other side. Amen. We allow them to make us or to break us. We allow them to be used in a condemnatory uh, fashion. Or are we going to come out on the other side and say, in spite of it all, I want God to get glory out of my life. 
It starts in the heart. May God help us this morning to guard our heart and uh, to use it for God's glory, to have a heart like God rather than a heart of man. All right, we need a horse this morning for good, please.